All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where people can join in and ask their questions all around their websites and search. Uh, a bunch of things were submitted already, uh, so we, we can go through some of that. But uh, as always, if any of you want to get started with a question, feel free to jump on in. Uh, hi, John. Hi. Recently, uh, we have faced uh, one issue with one of our clients' online cranking. So most of the time, the, it is a, a gift basket or gift hamper in your website, e-commerce website. And it ranks very well last a few four or five years. But this year, uh, we made some changes on the website. Like the blog we have, we moved it to the a subdomain. So now blog is the blog URL is like blog.domainname.com.au, something like this. That means all the URL of the blog post uh, changed. Now, our strategy was writing good content for the blog and attract backlink. And we give link from our blog to the product category and product page. But after changing this thing, after moving the blog from the domain to the subdomain, the ranking dropped a lot. So is this the reason? Uh, is it because we did 301 redirection, we submit the subdomain to the Google Search Console. But do you think it is because of the moving the blog from the domain to the subdomain? It might be. It's it's hard to say kind of, kind of absolutely. But what what might be happening there is that we we start seeing this as a separate site. And we we see essentially you going from one site to splitting it up into two sites. And that takes a while for us to understand. And uh, takes a while for us to understand kind of the context of those two new sites. I mean, even if it's the same content as before. Uh, so that's something that could be coming from that. But it is really kind of hard to say. Uh, and it's it's something where there's not, not really a technical indicator that would tell us this is because of this or because of that. Uh, it's, it's essentially just kind of the, the new ranking. And if this is something that was re recently done, like saying in the last couple of months, then I could imagine that it just takes a little bit longer to settle down. OK. And the next question is uh, the structured data. So if I add uh, two type of structured data in one page, is it OK? For example, if it is an e-commerce website and local business, so if I add one structured data for the product and another structured data for the local business, is it OK? Yeah. And my last question, uh, does Google consider blog comment as main content or supplementary content? It, it depends. I mean, we see it as a part of the page. So that's something where we, we would probably see it as part of the main content in the sense that when, when we look at a, a web page, we, we have things like the navigation all around, the footer, the sidebars. These things, which are kind of the, the parts that we would um, see as boilerplate content, so not, not as critical. But the, the blog post and kind of the, the changing content on, on a blog page, which would include the comments, is something that we would see as the, as the primary content. We would try to understand that these are blog comments, but essentially, the, these are a part of the, the primary page. And sometimes what, what can happen is that maybe you don't have a lot of content in your blog post, but there are lots of really good comments on there. So it's important for us to say, well, this could be something that is really useful for this particular page. So we should not just ignore it by default. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right, let me run through some of the questions that were submitted. And as always, you're, you're welcome to jump in in between. And we should have some time towards the end as well to go through other questions that come up. Uh, can editing the robot's text on the main domain affect crawling of images that are served by a separate CDN domain? 
Uh, what happens if the robots text for the CDN returns a 503? Uh, so robots text is per host name and protocol. Uh, so if if we're looking at a web page that's hosted on, say, www.example.com, and that includes content from a different subdomain or from a different domain completely, then we would use the, the primary robots text file on www.example.com for that page. And for the embedded content, we would use wherever that embedded content is hosted. Uh, so that's something where, essentially, for that request that we want to make to the server, we check for that subdomain, for that host name, uh, whether we are allowed to crawl it. So blocking something on the www version would not block it from being crawled from a, a different host name or a different subdomain. Uh, what happens if the robot's text returns 503? Uh, so 503 is a temporary error that basically tells us we should try again later. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one, probably the question because of the question as well, uh, in the sense that uh, we, we see these errors as blocking in that by default, when we see a server error, we say, we, we don't know what the robots text file is. So therefore, we will not crawl anything from this host name. That's kind of the default situation. Um, however, sometimes we see that uh, these kind of server errors are more like a permanent thing. They're not a temporary situation where we just temporarily can't get access to that file. Uh, but rather, we see this as, as a permanent error. And then in cases like that, we often fall back into kind of the state that, well, maybe the server is just sending us the wrong response code, and this should be a 404 page. Uh, so what, what generally, I, I, I think we have this documented in our robots text documentation as well. Uh, what generally happens is we see the 500 or 503 error. We stop crawling completely. And then after a certain period of time, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of months or so, I don't know if we have anything specifically documented there with the time frame. After that period of time, we think, well, this is a permanent error. So therefore, we should treat it like a permanent file not found and try to see what we can, what we can crawl normally. Uh, so that, that might be happening there. If, if it's been 503 for a really long time, Maybe we're crawling it because of that. Hiya, John. Uh, that was my question. Uh, part of the reason I asked it was there was a bit of misinformation going around and people giving incorrect advice. So I kind of wanted a bit of a, a backup on it. Uh, and the scenario was interesting. It was a, uh, a client with a Google Shopping, and their shopping campaign got completely uh, switched off because of the 503 error and they couldn't access the images. And two days ago, the company fixed the problem, and instantly the uh, images came back. So confirming yeah. that's your behavior. Yeah. That's, that seems kind of the, the way that it should be working. Yeah. Mm. So a 503 is, is also a good way of, of stopping crawling completely. If, if like there's some technical reason that you really need to stop crawling uh, of, of your website, then you can return 503 for your robots text file, and we'll stop crawling as soon as we reprocess that, which is usually within a day. Uh, so sometimes you need to have it stop crawling. Sometimes you don't want to have it stop crawling. <laughs> cool. Cheers. Cool. Um, then. Question about thin content. Uh, several months ago, we removed a lot of thin pages and redirected them to a single page, which consolidates the content from these thin pages into one page. Uh, the thin pages are still being indexed in search, even though they redirect to the new page. The URL inspection tool shows the thin pages as returning 200, but the screenshot so shows the correct redirected page. Uh, what's, what's happening here? Um, so. I think there are, there are a few things kind of combined here. On the one hand, redirecting thin pages and making a, a better version of a page, perfectly fine. I think that's, that's always a great idea. 
Uh, on the other hand, the URL inspection tool, we try to show the content that we would end up indexing there. So we f silently follow redirects uh, on pages like this. So if you look at a page that is redirecting to a valid page, then the URL inspection tool will say, well, there's a valid page here, because that's what we would index under that URL. So you don't see that redirect there. That's kind of confusing if you're trying to diagnose a redirect like this. Um, the last thing that, that almost always happens with, with redirects is that we continue to understand where the page used to be hosted, kind of the old URL. And uh, if someone explicitly looks for something that seems like they're looking for the old URL, we'll try to show it to them. Uh, so a really common way to, to see this is if you do a site query for an old domain, if you've moved to a different domain, you'll continue to see a lot of results there. And that's not uh, because we kind of didn't process those results, but rather because we think you're looking for the old domain, so we'll, we'll show it to you, uh, kind of trying to be helpful when probably you don't want us to be helpful. Um, so with the site query, that's pretty common. Uh, but what, what I imagine might also be happening in, in your specific case is if someone is looking for a, a query or looking at a query that looks very similar to your old URL, um, like taking the words from the old URL and they're looking for that, then it might be that we would show that old URL in search as well. Um, a good way to double check that we're picking up the new one is the URL inspection tool, kind of checking out which one we have indexed, uh, looking at the cache page. So usually, if you look at the cache page, you'll see the URL of the new page, uh, which with, with that example that you have there, it, that's what's happening there. So from, from my point of view, I, I don't think you need to do anything different here. Uh, it's just kind of. Maybe it's good to be aware that sometimes we show the old URL in search, uh, even though we've switched everything over to the new URL. And I, I think you also mentioned the URL removal tool in the question. You definitely don't need to do that. The URL removal tool would just hide that page in search. So in that case, if someone is looking for kind of the words that would trigger your old URL to be shown, and you have the URL removal tool active, then we would not show anything. We wouldn't even show the new one. So the removal tool doesn't affect the, the choice of canonical or the choice of the visible URL. Um, I have a website that was of mediocre quality, but I improved it a lot in terms of content. Now it's suddenly appearing on pages four to six and sort of stuck there for the last two months. Uh, I read you once mentioned that the effects of refining websites can take more than six months to reflect in search. Does that still hold true? Uh, if yes, uh, then it wouldn't make much more sense to start with a new domain instead of kind of improving the old one. Um, so six months is not a, a fixed time. Uh, that's essentially just something that I, I see from time to time. And uh, it's particularly something that, with larger websites, you tend to see. Like If you make really significant changes on a larger website, then there's a lot of content that needs to be recrawled and reprocessed, and that takes a lot of time. Uh, so that's kind of where I, I pulled that six months number out. It doesn't mean it will always take six months. Uh, it doesn't mean that like it will always be complete in six months. Sometimes it takes longer. A lot of times for, for smaller websites, um, it usually ends up happening a little bit faster. Uh, so in your case, it sounds like it's more of a smaller website if you kind of significantly improve the, the content of the whole website, then that seems like something that you can kind of, I don't know, like I'm, I'm guessing on the order of maybe 100, a couple hundred pages. And that's something that usually we would be able to crawl and index a lot faster. Um, with regards to, to the ranking in general, there, there is no kind of fixed rule that we would rank pages significantly higher after you've improved the content 
these things do take time as well. And sometimes improving the content, it's like there, there's a lot involved with improving a website. It's not just like rewriting some pieces of text and making them look a little bit better. Uh, so that's something where I continue to work on this to try to find ways to improve that. Um, if, if you're active in a competitive area, then it might also make sense to kind of think about how you can differentiate yourself from, from other sites, not just with, with regards to kind of the content that you have there, but kind of with your, your offering in general. Like, what can you provide that is significantly different than everyone else? Uh, that is such that when people see your, your stuff for the first time, uh, that they'll be able to, or they'll want to come back specifically to your site. Uh, hi, John. Hi. Yo, how are you? Pretty good. Yeah, and uh, I have a question regarding Google Search Console. Like uh, one of the website we have uh, in Google Search Console account, uh, it's showing that the site sitemap is not able to be fetched. So when I uh, cross check the in detail error, what is it? It's showing that HTTP 301 error. But in fact, uh, there is no uh, 301 redirection has been defined, and the URL is accessible without any. No uh, problem. I just want to know, like, uh, will it be any like uh, temporary uh, kind of thing, or do we need to do anything specific? And right now, there is no preferred domain setting. Also, is not there right now in the new search console. Like, how uh, I can uh, uh, fix this? Like, yeah, yeah. So, preferred domain you you wouldn't need for for sitemap file, but uh, like like with any of the other features in Search Console. That, uh, that are not migrated over to the new Search Console yet, uh, that's something you can continue to use those features. Just because it's in the old Search Console doesn't mean you can't use them. Uh, so I, I would continue to use that. Uh, with regards to sitemap file, it, it might be good if you could uh, send me a link to the sitemap file. Maybe you can drop it in the chat here, and then I can take a look at that with, with the sitemaps folks afterwards. Sure. Thank you. Cool. All right. Let's suppose we have two authors. One is an expert, uh, and one is a no, no name. They write exactly the same piece of content. Will there be any difference in ranking based on which name is shown as the article author? Um, I don't know. This, is, this feels like a very theoretical question in the sense that like in, in practice, if you're writing as an expert, then you highlight your, your expertise. And you show to users, you show everyone that you're, you know what you're talking about. You kind of have background information. You can back your information up. So uh, that's something where I, I would expect, from even from a user's point of view, to understand that there's a difference between this kind of content. And in general, when you're making a website, I, I would Take take steps to make sure that you're highlighting why your version of this content is is a good version and why people should be able to trust you because like you have background information or you uh, kind of have all of these references that you can point at or you're you're an expert in this field. All of these things are, are things that I would. I would try to highlight as much as possible. And that's something that we would be able to pick up uh, directly or indirectly sometimes. It, it really depends on the pages themselves. But uh, it's something I wouldn't kind of treat as a theoretical thing, but rather it's like this is a practical way of showing why people should trust your website and kind of come to you rather than to, to random other people. So that's something where I I would expect things to that all all that to kind of make sense and help out a bit. Um, oh wow! So many so many people uh, jumping in. Um, does Google consume structured data better if it's coded in an at graph versus separate snippets in JSON LD? And there's there's a link to I think. Uh, a plugin that does some um, structured data. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of any difference with regards to how we process this structured data. In general, uh, what, 
what happens with structured data is either we can read it or we can't read it. It's not that there is a better or a worse, or kind of like if you do it like this, provide the exact same information in structured data as you would do it in a different way, that one would be better and one would be treated with more weight or given a ranking advantage or anything like that. Uh, if the structured data is valid, if it works in the testing tools, uh, if it shows up in Search Console as something that we've processed, then, then it works. So there's no kind of better or worse from our point of view if we can process it. And I know Yoast uh, specifically that, that you linked to there, they, they spend a lot of time to make sure that their structured data works. So that's something where if, if it works for you by, by using a plugin like this, then, then go for it. I wouldn't like say you, you have to manually code it or you have to do it exactly the same way as we have in the developer documentation, but rather if it, if it works, if it's technically correct, if it can be processed, then it can be processed. Um, I'm having an issue where Google is ignoring 301 redirects when selecting canonical URLs. Um, so I think this probably falls into a similar situation as one of the earlier questions. Um, so what, one thing may, maybe I, I did not uh, with, with the other question is when, when it comes to canonicalization, we use multiple factors to try to figure out which URL we should be showing in search. Uh, so which one we should pick as a canonical URL. Uh, a 301 redirect is definitely a really strong sign. Uh, there's also the rel canonical that you can put on a page, uh, the meta tag or the, the header tag. Uh, internal linking plays a really big role for us. Like if, if you're saying this page is canonical, but you're not treating it as a canonical, then that would be kind of tricky for us. Uh, external linking plays a role as well. Sitemap files, hreflang, all of these references of individual URLs within your website, they, they do play a role for us. So uh, that's something where sometimes these signals all align, and we try to follow that. And sometimes they're, they're a bit confusing, and we have to guess. And if you make it so that Google has to guess, then Google will guess, and maybe it won't guess what you want it to ha have happened. Uh, so that's kind of just as, as background uh, with regards to canonicals. The other thing that, that I think is also really important to realize is that uh, these things are, are generally not a ranking issue in the sense that if Google picks a different canonical, it doesn't mean your pages will rank worse. Uh, it just means that we will show that page with that specific URL in search. And usually, the ranking would be exactly the same as uh, any other canonical page. So for us, it's more a matter of a, of a practical thing, like which URL should we show in search? Which URL should we be crawling the most? Uh, that's kind of the, the thing there. So if we're not picking the canonical that you want, at least it's still ranking in the same place. It's not critical that you urgently need to jump in and change something to, to make Google pick that up. Uh, so let me look at the examples that you have there. You have a redirect from a page that moved from one domain to another. Uh, Google selected the old domain as canonical despite visiting the new page in October. Uh, so to, to me, the, there might be two things happening here. On the one hand, maybe you're doing a site query for the old domain. If you do that, then we will definitely try to show the old domain, even for a really long period of time. Uh, sometimes multiple years, we'll know that the old domain used to be here and that it's now redirecting. And doing a site query for an old domain will still show that. So, like October of this year, that seems like something definitely we, we, we could still be showing if you explicitly look for that old domain. Uh, the other thing is, if you're saying this page was visited in October, that sounds like a page that we don't crawl that often. So that's probably something where maybe it's just a matter of us getting to all of these pages as well, uh, but kind of like, like I said, in general, this is not something that would be affecting the ranking of this page. It's really just the URL that is shown for that page in the search results. Uh, redirect on a category page, adjusting the URL structure, now using parameters. Um, 
that seems like something where it might be that you're explicitly looking for those with the site query. Uh, it might also be that there's still kind of conflicting signals that we're seeing for, for these kind of things. So if you're changing the internal URL structure of a website, then often we'll still see a lot of internal links that are going to the old pages. And as a user, when you're clicking around on the website, you don't necessarily immediately see that. Uh, but what you can do is use a, a local crawler uh, something like Screaming Frog or, I don't know, Deep Crawl or the, these various crawler tools and run it over your website to really make sure that there are no links still going to the old version of the page that end up being redirected. Uh, so if you can really make sure that your internal navigation is clean and only points at the new URLs, then that helps us quite a bit. Hey, John, a uh, couple of quick questions on Canonical sure. topic. Sure. Uh, so one is related to that experiment I'm running with uh, changing the URL to see if the page will start ranking better. Uh, you mentioned last time just uh, show a 404 code to Google while also showing the page to um, to users so that Google drops it completely out of the index while users can still access it because Google did a canonical from our old URL when we dropped it to the new URL, despite showing a 404 for the old URL. Uh, so, so the idea is that we did that. We did the 404 uh, code, and the page completely dropped out of the index. Uh, but the old URL is still showing a canonical to this one that we 404. So is it normal that I can see in Search Console uh, a URL that shows a canonical to another page that's uh, 404 now? I, I think that could happen, but that's more like a temporary state uh, in the sense that like, we, we need to propagate all of this information back in the index as well. Uh, I imagine over time that that will just be seen as a 404 everywhere. Um, but so if I change the URL to a new one now and let Google index it, uh, would I have any issues in those older URLs changing and pointing as a Google choosing a canonical for this new one? I don't know. It's it seems like a very confusing state at the moment. Yeah. So should I just um, wait a bit more? I. I would let it settle down a little bit okay. first. Yeah, yeah. OK. You're uh, testing all of these weird things that, that are like internal anecdotes almost uh, of how, how we store things. So it's, it's kind of cool to see. Living dangerously, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just let the holidays pass then and, and see afterwards. Uh, okay. One other thing is re related to the URL parameters tool. Uh, so uh, the d documentation doesn't really cover one case where um, uh, so you can choose which page should Google crawl and you have the uh, representative URL there. Uh, so the documentation doesn't cover that case. So I'm not sure exactly what representative URL is. I mean, would Google crawl that URL as the representative URL or yeah. the one that it Canonicalizes to or what exactly? No, is that? no. We would try to pick that that one that you specify. So that's for for example, if you have, um, let's say you have multiple product variants and you have a, a parameter or something that specifies which variant, uh, and you have I don't know. Different color shoes, for example, why not? Uh, like black, green, blue, and the parameter is like color equals black, color equals blue. Sure. Uh, then you could say this this color parameter is one that you don't want to have crawled, and the representative one is always black. It's like black shoes fit everywhere, kind of thing. Uh, so that's how you could tell us like this is the one representative URL that replaces all of these others. But in the URL parameters, you don't get to choose the parameter value, though. So you only get to choose the. So okay, let me I give you an exact, an exact example. Maybe I'm misremembering that 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 setting, but 
that's what I thought. Okay, I, I'll have to like click into that to, to double check though. Just to give you a quick example, let's say you're using UTM uh, tracking parameters and you have that parameter there, like UTM campaign, and you choose yeah. representative URL. Uh, is that does that mean that Google will try to pick those URLs that contain UTM campaign as the canonical version? If you choose representative URL, I don't know. You're confusing me now, so I <laughs> I would need to. Yeah. I, I I'll double check afterwards. Uh, if if okay. we still have time afterwards, maybe we can we sure. can double check together. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Cool. Okay. Uh, does Google throttle or reduce link value to content that is significantly updated? For example, you may have very old content with lots of links that's seriously out of date. If you rewrite the content, does Google kind of say, well, this isn't uh, what people link to, so we're not going to pass value to those links anymore? Uh, no, we, we don't really do that. Um, the, the one thing where, where I see that sometimes happening is when it comes to things like expired domains. So if you just buy some expired domain and you put your own content up there, then from our point of view, like, that's, that's a different site. It's not like suddenly the old expired domain is, is passing everything on to your, your site. So that's the one case there. But with normal changes within a website, it's absolutely no problem. Sometimes content changes. Sometimes it changes significantly. That's that's perfectly normal. Um, I use the Korean character on a URL of my post, but when I share it on Facebook, the URL appears in this uh, format, kind of the escaped URL version. Uh, the URL becomes so long. Uh, does it also affect my SEO or? Does it change anything, essentially? Uh, it doesn't change anything. Uh, you can use an escaped version of the URL. It's essentially treated as exactly the same URL from our side internally. Uh, if we see a link that goes to your website that uses an escaped URL, we will kind of unescape that when it comes to indexing. Uh, similarly, internal linking, you can use escaped URLs, or you can use kind of direct Unicode characters in the URL. Uh, both of those are completely equivalent. Equivalent. It's not that there's a redirect uh, in place there. It's essentially the exact same URL, just different ways of writing it. Um, can you tell me whether schema.org slash course markup is supported outside of the USA? I don't really know, but I will check for you. Um, my, my understanding was it's supported everywhere, but you're saying it's not, so I, I'll double check. Uh, you earlier recommended not to block URLs with parameters since Google can't canonicalize the pages correctly and that the value from links to those pages gets lost. Uh, for example, we should use rel canonical instead of robots text or meta no index. Uh, my question is on an e commerce website with many pages, do you also recommend no following links to filters which create URL parameters for crawl budget reasons? Um, I, I would do that. I mean, that's something where using nofollow probably makes sense. If you create a lot of filter variations for URLs, then that could make sense. Uh, but you can also you just link essentially normally with normal URL parameters. And you can also use the URL parameters settings tool uh, to help us with this. We, we have a really, really long blog post on faceted navigation with I think it's like five good practices and five bad practices, um, which covers all of this. So I would really double check that. Uh, the thing with, with robots text in particular, I, I think I mentioned this, is like we don't know what is behind that URL at all. So we can't canonicalize things. If there's a link there, we don't know what to do with it. Um, that's kind of the, the one thing there. Uh, the, the other thing that, that I realized when I first read this question, uh, when I looked at it before, is our crawling and indexing team, they have never told me to go to a website and tell them to use robots text to block something like filters or pagination on, on an e-commerce website. It's always the opposite cases. So it's something where if, if there is an issue with regards to crawling and indexing content, 
the, the crawling team is more likely to tell me to go and, and contact the website and tell them, hey, you have something incorrect with your robot sex file. You need to unblock things so that we understand your site better. And they've never sent me out to kind of contact any e-commerce site and tell them to add robots text blocks because like we get lost in the filters or we get lost in the pagination. Uh, so that's kind of as an anecdote there. Um, they, they've also never told us to go off and tell people to use nofollow for internal navigation. So that's, that's another interesting part there in that, for the most part, we, we should be able to deal with e-commerce sites and the normal navigations that they provide. Uh, for AMP search results, does Google gather the article structure data from the AMP page itself or from the canonical page? Uh, will the AMP rich results work if only the canonical page has the structured data? Uh, so this is a, a confusing one that confuses me, at least, um, apparently also, also you, uh, in that uh, we need to see the, the markup on both versions of the page. Uh, it's not just that we would say, well, the AMP version canonicalizes to the desktop version, so we'll just use that one. Uh, but rather, we would show the AMP version in the search results. So we need to make sure that the markup there is also uh, that what we would show in the search results. Uh, so things like the article markup, that matters. Uh, also things like metadata, like robots text meta tags. Uh, they matter there, too. Uh, if you have a no index on the AMP version and an index on the desktop version, then like, should we show the AMP version or should we not show the other version? It's, it gets really confusing. So ideally, make sure that the AMP version has the same structure data, the same metadata as the primary version of the page. Uh, or when, when I talk with the AMP team, they're always like, can't you encourage people just to use AMP? Like, if, if they're already using AMP for, for the content and able to use it, sometimes it makes sense to just use AMP as a web framework and make the whole page AMP. Uh, does a website's cache configuration have anything to do with the time it takes Google to index it? No. Uh, not at all. So the, the cache configuration usually applies to uh, how a browser would be able to load that page with regards to being able to cache CSS files or things like that. And that doesn't affect us for indexing the web page at all. Uh, for rendering, we also pretty much ignore all of those cache parameters uh, because, they're, because we do things so differently in rendering than a normal browser would do. So we can cache things like CSS files for a really long time and just reuse that, and it works well. Uh, for rendering, whereas in a browser, maybe you don't have that much storage to actually cache things that long. Uh, machine learning has been a part of Google search algorithm, and I can imagine it's getting smarter every day. Uh, do you, as an employee with access to the secret files, know the exact reason why pages rank better than others? Or is the algorithm now making decisions and evolving in a way that makes it impossible for humans to understand? Um, we, we get this question every now and then. Um, and uh, we're not allowed to get, provide an answer because the machines are telling us not to talk about this topic. So it's, I, I really can't answer. No, just kidding. Uh, it's, it's something where we use machine learning in lots of ways to help us kind of understand things better. Uh, but machine learning isn't just this one black box that does everything for you, like you feed the internet in on one side and the other side come out search results, it's a tool for us. It's essentially a way of uh, testing things out a lot faster, trying things out, figuring out what, what the right uh, solution there is. Uh, so for example, uh, we, we use machine learning for canonicalization. Uh, so what, what that kind of means is we have all of those factors that we talked about before. And we give them individual weights. That's kind of the traditional way to do it. And we say, well, rel canonical has this much weight, and redirect has this much weight, and internal linking has this much weight. And the traditional approach would be to say, well, we will just make up those weights, those numbers, and see if it works out. And if we see that things don't work out, we will tweak those numbers a little bit. 
And with machine learning, what we can essentially do is say, well, this is the outcome that we want to have achieved. And machine learning algorithms should figure out these weights on their own. Uh, so it's not so much that machine learning does everything with canonicalization on its own, but rather it has this well-defined problem. Uh, it's working out, like, what, what are these numbers that we should have there as weights, and kind of repeatedly trying to relearn that system and understanding, like, on the web, this is how people do it, and this is where things go wrong, and that's why we should choose these numbers. Uh, so when it comes to debugging that, we, we still have those numbers. We still have those weights there. It's just that they're determined by machine learning algorithms. And uh, if we see that things go wrong, then we need to find a way, like, how can we tell the machine learning algorithm that actually, in this case, we should have taken into account, I don't know, phone numbers on a page more rather than just the pure content to kind of separate like local versions, for example. And that's something that, that we can do when we kind of train these algorithms. So with, with all of these machine learning things, it's not that there's one black box and it just does everything and nobody knows why it does things. Uh, but rather, we try to apply it to specific problems where it makes sense to automate things a little bit in a way that saves us time and that helps to pull out patterns that maybe we wouldn't have recognized manually if we looked at it. John, I know it's been on the news uh, like a couple of weeks ago that uh, Google has developed um, a set of tools to be able to kind of explain what's going on well, uh, when, in machine learning models. And you, you gave that example with weights to, to pages where they, which canonical version should, should they pick. Uh, so are you using those, those kind of tools to kind of understand what weights are actually being chosen and whether those are the correct ones to choose and adjust afterwards and things like that? I, I don't know specifically the, the setup that you're referring to, but we, we do try to understand as much as possible what, what is happening there. And that's something where the, the search quality team, they, they do have ways of of debugging all of these things. So uh, on the one hand, you can do that by, by separating, out, separating out these problems a little bit more. And uh, on the other hand, it's like you just, like with a complex system like Google Search, there are just always a lot of individual pieces that are moving around. Uh, so even without machine learning, it's not, not trivial, but it's something that we need to be able to debug. Uh, because people come to us with weird ranking issues. Like, I, I get them from here every now and then. You've sent me some really weird ones. And uh, it's something that we, we need to be able to figure out why, why is this happening, and is this happening at a larger scale? Is it just happening to this one page or this one site? Uh, what, what can we do to improve it? So uh, that's something where you always need kind of an an understanding of what, what happened here, how did we get to this state, how can we improve it? Yeah, I think it's called explainable AI. I think that's how Google coined it. OK. Yeah. I, I don't know if we use that, that exact thing. I mean, we, there's like so many different AI machine learning systems out there nowadays. Uh, it's, I, I could imagine we, we use something like that for some, some aspects of search or some of our systems, and other aspects use other things. So no. But in any case, like also the, the meta question here, does anyone really know how the algorithm works? And that is something where we do have a lot of people in search quality that are able to debug pretty much any query and understand what, what is happening here. Uh, why, why are things ranking the way they are? Um, that's something that, that, for example, Gary has spent a lot of time on as well. And he's, he's been working on some of these search things, too. So uh, it's not like, limited to this elite set of priests somewhere in Mountain View that know what is happening, but rather like, in, engineers can learn it. And it's something that we, we need to have at that level. It's not. Like, it shouldn't be a big black box if we want to be able to improve it. Um, OK, really long question on videos. Uh, so uh, I 
so it goes into like video structure data markup and uh, kind of the questions are I let's say I host my video on YouTube would structure data and video sitemap help Google to choose my landing page to be ranked over my YouTube page uh, not necessarily so the structured data gives us more information about how you're embedding the video, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your page will be better suited than the YouTube landing page. Um, however, it all depends on the query and the type of content you have on these pages. So if you have really good content that matches well what, what the user's intent is for, for a query, then we'll try to show your page. And if otherwise the same content is available on the YouTube page and it's really visible and prominent there and it's kind of hidden away on your page, then maybe the YouTube page is a better landing page for that specific query. It's not that we would always show one or the other. It's that we try to understand which of these pages is more relevant. Um, and then let's see. Uh, how does Google make sure that the page, including the video structure data or video sitemap, belongs to them, uh, that it's the same entity? We, I believe we don't necessarily do that in the sense that like we're trying to figure out what the most relevant page is, but we try not to make any algorithmic uh, kind of evaluation on who the owner of the video is and is this person who's embedding the video allowed to embed that video. Uh, in practice, this is something that you can specify on YouTube where you can say, I want to allow embedding of the video, or I don't want to allow embedding of the video. And if the video doesn't work on a page, then chances are it's not going to perform that well in search in the sense that if users don't see that video ever, they're not going to recommend that page as a video landing page anyway. Um, Finally, if the goal of my video campaign is to drive more traffic to my website instead of brand awareness, some SEOs suggest to use self-hosting instead of YouTube. Uh, do you agree with this point of view? You, you can do that if you want. So I, I think one of the big advantages of using a platform like YouTube or Vimeo or any of the other big video platforms is that they have infrastructure that makes sure that your videos just work really well everywhere. Uh, they have uh, kind of caches and content delivery nodes pretty much worldwide to, to make sure that it, it just works really quickly. It doesn't have to go through your one server. Uh, so that's something where I, I think there's a lot of value in using these, these kind of setups as, as CDNs for kind of video content. Uh, so that's something where I wouldn't necessarily say, like, you should avoid it or you should host it yourself. Uh, but rather, like, if you want to host it yourself, that's perfectly fine. That's totally up to you. Uh, but just keep in mind that sometimes the, the technical requirements can be quite tricky. Um, hey, John. Uh, hi. Uh, can I add a question four to that? Uh, sure. Uh, I've been doing quite a bit of video markup lately. And what I find is quite a few of the parameters that you want to do in the markup will not be visible on the page. Things like duration of the video, uh, even maybe the description, because the video kind of describes itself. Uh, so is there any issue if you are marking that up in meta tags and things like that? Uh, does Google understand it's kind of in the video? <laughs> um, I mean, what we wouldn't do is extract kind of the content of the video to try to figure out how we should rank it. So, so things like transcribing the video and understanding what the text is inside and then trying to rank that video based on that, I don't think we would do that. Um, from, from YouTube, that's something where I, I believe they show the transcription as a part of a page. So like theoretically, that could be on the page there. Um, but. Uh, when it comes to descriptions and things like that, I, I would try to put those on the page somewhere or in, in the video markup itself. That's also one of the things where like, a lot of these things come up, come, come to me when, when it comes to mobile-first indexing, in that the mobile-first indexing team will come and say, well, this site is not performing as well on mobile or when we would switch it to mobile-first indexing because the videos are not able to be picked up properly. And uh, often that, that comes down to video structure data. 
Uh, it comes down to the, the positioning of the video on the page, kind of is it a prominent part of the page or not. Uh, where on mobile, maybe you have a completely different layout of the page, and suddenly the video, instead of being like in the middle and center and large, is like this small aspect in the corner somewhere, then that's something where we would not kind of be able to send as much video traffic to, to a site like that, because we don't think it's really it's not really the same kind of video landing page as the desktop version would be. So all of these things uh, are, are things that the, the mobile-first indexing team kind of, kind of brings up and, and we talk about with regards to, to videos. And that does include the structured data. It uh, does include things like the description in the structured data. Uh, that kind of does play a little bit of a role there. It might be that we don't show it directly in the search results, but it's still useful for us for, for ranking purposes. Right. Cheers. All right. I just noticed we're kind of at time. So like, if, if there's anything left from your side that you want to ask right away, feel free. And otherwise, I'll pause the recording in a few minutes and stay online for a little bit longer if you just want to chat about other things as well. Hi, John. I've got a question, if that's OK. All right. Um, I have a client at the moment who appears to have some sort of a penalty. Um, we've acquired a number of high-quality editorial links over the last couple of years, but there's very little movement in SERPs. And we are getting a new website built, and we have the opportunity to um, to start fresh in a new, a new domain. And I'm just wondering, based on your, your Twitter content uh, comment last week about um, about building on shaky foundations, if you would recommend not uh, performing a 301 when we build the new site um, in order to not pass it across any, any issues. So you'd be starting on a new domain with completely new content, or? Yeah. 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 But we do have the opportunity. I know we, we could 301 um, and, I guess, take take the risk. Um, but it's, it's very hard to understand what's going on. It's just with very little set movement over the last two years. I'm putting a significant amount of work into trying to to move things. You know, we did a lot of technical work. We, we tried this of those for, for old shady links that other agencies have built in the past, um, but it doesn't seem to be lifting. Um, so I just want to give the client the best, the best advice going forward. Yeah. It's it's really hard to say offhand. I mean, the uh, on the one hand, starting with a new domain with a new website is is a chance to start fresh. On the other hand, that also means you do start fresh. So all of the kind of recommendations, the links, everything that you've built up over the years, would would essentially be gone, and you need to kind of take your knowledge of that niche and. And like go out and present yourself uh, as as a fresh website, essentially. So it's like it has pros and cons. It feels like a lot of work uh, compared to trying to improve something old. Uh, but sometimes, like especially if there's really weird stuff that has been happening with your old website, sometimes it makes sense to start fresh and uh, try it like that. Just just having a look at the links. Um, some of the links just appear to be. You know, the guest post outreach type links that they've done, um, where there was a significant use of author boxes. Um, and that to me seems like the, the only issue that, that there could be um, from a, you know, from a, from a link perspective. Um, and I'm just wondering if that, if that could be a factor. Um, it, it is a big, a bit, bit of a, a risk starting from scratch. You know, they've, they've got, um, they've got lo locations up and down the country. So they've got a a lot of location pages um, and several Google My Businesses and stuff. So it would be it would be a lot of work. So I'm just, I'm just I, if you're I, I think I think offhand I try to avoid starting from scratch, especially okay. if if there are lots of local local listings as well and all of that. It seems like that's a lot of value to throw away uh, for for something like this. So that's. Kind of my my gut feeling there. Uh, it's also something where if you don't see something like a manual action in in Search Console, then probably it's not not that tricky with regards to to the links there. 
Um, but if you want to stick around after the rec recording stops, I, I can take a quick look to see if, if I see anything obvious. I mean, I it's kind of that. hard like as a, yeah. a two-minute check of a site, but yeah. uh, may, maybe there's something obvious. And it sounds like you're in, in that almost desperate situation where like, uh, throw everything away and start over exactly. or yep. continue working. So. But the, the last part of the question is just, you know, um, if if we did decide to do to new domain it, um, would a three hundred one possibly just pass pass along the problem? Um, so I guess the other part of the question is, should we three hundred one or or not, and just stick with the with the current domain? Yeah. So if you three hundred one from one domain to another, then you're forwarding all of those signals. Everything. Uh, so I. Yeah. So so links would be forwarded. All of that would essentially be forwarded. And we we essentially see the new domain as as a variation of the old one. So I don't think that would be that useful, uh, which which also kind of makes makes it even harder, I, I guess, in, in a case like yours. But I, I'm happy to take a quick look afterwards if you want to kind of like drop the link in the chat, and then I can take a quick look. That's great, John. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, John. Hi. Uh, uh, I have a question related to the uh, local paths. Like I have seen uh, so many uh, local listings which have not optimized their sites and uh, still they are ranking. So is there any specific parameter which we need to optimize on our sites for the local path specifically? For Google Local, I, I don't know how Google Local does, does the ranking. So that's that's really hard. But in, in general, what what I sometimes see, not specific with, with regards to the local business listings, but with regards to sites in general, is that uh, there, there are lots of sites that do things wrong or that do things in ways that is not optimal. And they can still appear well in search because they, they have lots of other signals that are telling us this is actually a pretty useful site. Uh, so that's something that, that might be happening there, where if you look at it, you say, well, they're missing all of these obvious optimizations, but they're still ranking, uh, then yeah. it might be that maybe they're doing other things really well, and that kind of even things out. So it's not that you have to do everything. You have to do everything perfect. It's like we, we try to pick the, the factors that play a role and to rank them accordingly. OK, thank you. All right, let me stop the recording here. And if you want, you, you're welcome to, to hang around for a little bit longer. And uh, we can chat about sites or anything else. And otherwise, I, I want to thank you all for, for joining in. Uh, thanks for submitting so many questions. Um, I, I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all again in one of the future Hangouts. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, John. Thank you. Sí.